The following podcast was recorded on Thursday, May 13th, 2021, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to Talking Data. Our Talking Data series seeks to offer timely insights into macro market themes along with macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading. Today I'm joined by Jim Bianco and Ben Breitholtz. And today we're gonna to be focusing on the 10 year treasury yield. At the time of this recording, we're at 1.67%. Um, Jim, why don't you start us off and talk about how connected our risk assets to the US Treasury yields? Yeah, and I'll start off by throwing up the first chart we have of a 10 year yield. So for those of you that are watching on YouTube um, or the video, you can see the 10 year yield. Uh, it is risen from 50 basis points in August to 1.78% in late March. Backed off a little bit, uh, got as low as a week ago on the payroll report is 146. And now as Kristen says, 167, it was 170 a little bit earlier today. So the first thing I wanna point out about the 10 year yield is it's been rising quite a bit for the last several months, probably in, in some anticipation of the data that we've seen. And it seems like what everybody's doing now, and I don't think they're wrong, is they're taking their cues off the 10 year note. So when we see these big inflation numbers, CPI yesterday, PPI on the day we're recording, or the payroll report last week, which some think might have been because employers are not paying enough to get people back to work, that there's an inflation brewing, how am I supposed to feel about it? And the answer is take a look at the 10-year note. Is it breaking out to higher yields? That would be a tell that it is a worry is it breaking down? It would be a tell that it's not a worry. But where we are now as we record is we're back towards the one month highs in the 10 year note. And we're kind of just holding there for right now, 167, 170. So we're in an indeterminate place right now. We haven't broken out, we haven't broken down. So we're just kind of waiting. And this I think is consistent with this whole base effect thing. As we've been talking on this podcast, we knew that come April, May, we were going to get a base effect. We were going to get a big jump up in the inflation numbers, which has happened a little bit more than people thought, but the basic thing has happened. And then we knew that there is the built-in excuse that whatever the inflation numbers show, you could just say base effect, base effect, base effect. And maybe that's right. Maybe it's not but it does give us a reason to kick the can down the road, not to make a decision about inflation. Is it here or isn't it here just yet? So the bottom line is yesterday when interest rates moved up, the stock market had a bad day. Today, as they've backed off of that 170 peak, the stock market is having a better day. I think everybody's taking their cues off the interest rate market because they believe it's gonna tell them how they should feel about inflation. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that the 10 year note is kind of, you know, sung a nice sweet lullaby for the past, you know, number of weeks and just kind of stuck in this range, which is not too shocking after we had one of the best kind of, or I guess worst, you know, bear runs. If you look at like 20 day trading day breakout strategies, uh, we had one of the longest one that endured uh, essentially into, you know, the middle of April and now has ended. And now we're in this like tight 20 day trading range that's lasted for about 44 trading days. And uh, um, so the question is, like you said, is what happens here? Which direction do we ultimately break out? And that's gonna have some impact on pretty much anything and everything going forward. So under the surface, if you look at the correlations and here we're looking at ruling 45 day correlations, which we have some charts, um, looking at yields relative to the VIX. So you know, in terms of amount of implied volatility and the S&P 500 or expected volatility was happening. Um, the charts actually up here is showing uh, the same thing, yields relative to the S&P 500, we could start here. And nominal yields, which are have typically been positively correlated to the S&P 500, that's actually ended 
on a rolling 45 trading day basis. So that's come negative. We're right around negative 0.17, nothing too scary, nothing like we saw back in the 1990s, but um, it does mean there is a shift underway. Same things happening with now tips break evens relative to the S&P 500. Previously, inflation was treated as good. Um, you know, the Fed is encouraging it and markets had said, fine, if we get economic growth, we get uh, coupled with inflation, that's fine. Um, and we saw a positive correlation. That's all of a sudden nosediving. If that turns appreciably negative, now we got real concern that's brewing within risk assets of high, you know, inflation that's on the rise, nominal yields on the rise, and so on. I think this really kicks off once, once or if we get a breakout in yields, um, uh, you know, higher out of this range, uh, which I would lean that direction, um, given all the impetus here, um, and I think some of the what's behind the scenes, away from just these transitory bursts in inflation, thanks to you know airline or airfares, autos, you know, used autos that is, and car rentals. Um, there's going to be some other things we'll discuss later in this podcast that could allow that story to really continue into the summer months. I just would underscore. I just underscore one thing real quick. Um, Ben's correlation charts, they have come down to near zero, and the big story here is the stock bond relationship might be undergoing a transition. For those that use a 60/40 portfolio, wealth managers or use <laughs> risk parity strategies. There's an assumption here on a relationship between stocks and bonds. It hasn't broken down. It's kind of gotten to the ledge here, and we'll see which way it wants to go. But we're getting, you know, into a decision point. So these are not just theoretical arguments. These are also practical arguments too for risk parity, for wealth managers, for the way that a lot of people invest their money in terms of uh, the stock bond relationship. And Jim, do you want to touch any more on the trading range in terms of how long we can expect it to go and why? Yeah, so now that we've kind of established the idea that, you know, bonds are kind of driving the, the bus and these correlations are breaking down and we're going to see which way we go. Next question becomes, where do we go next in the trading range? I'm Jimmy Inflationista, so I think we go higher in, in terms of yields right now. So I would say that this range is pretty typical from a technical analyst standpoint, put on my CMT hat and say that we're just trending sideways right now and we're setting up for a breakout towards higher yields. Typically, technical analysis says, whatever, whenever you get into a consolidation pattern, which we are now, sideways action, you break out in the direction you came into it. So we rose then we went sideways and that's considered a continuation pattern and then we should break out towards higher yields. I think that makes sense. The fundamental story I would give you on that breakout and higher yields is, is the base effects kind of wear off and the inflation numbers don't and people start getting more worried and it starts getting reflected in bond yields and then bond yields start to bother everybody else. And lastly, I did want to, we set this up so we could separate these ideas. There's bond yields are driving everything. That's an idea we want you to leave you with. And then there's our opinion on where bond yields are going to go. So we don't want to just make it a, oh, Jimmy thinks higher rates and it, he's either right or wrong, but there's a bigger fundamental story here. So go bonds, so go risk markets. And so, you know, what I look at too historically is, so I just said earlier, we had one of the, you know, most consistent, quickest bear moves in treasuries, you know, on record. And that took sharp ratios across the entire curve. If you look at the strips curve, from two years out to 30 years, we have some of the worst sharp ratios or risk adjusted returns we've really had again in history, or at least it's it's on par with some of uh, the worst events in like 94 and so on. And if you look at when these instances have happened historically, you've almost always, actually I could almost say always, seen a precipitous drop in yield. So just the fact that if we remain sideways and ultimately break higher, this time will be different. Uh, you know, again, this is kind of like these great like generational buying opportunities. You know, you get these this nasty sell-off in, in bonds, uh, same, you know, similar technical setup going all the way back to the mid-1980s. And this has been the best time to swoop in and buy. Um, and uh, but if that doesn't play out this time around, um, and kind of on the heels here of our next question, our next question and topic, if we get this regime shift higher in sticky and you know core prices 
and break out to the upside. Now we're doing something different. And this is something that investors have to pay attention to, especially if these correlations we we're just discussing uh, become an issue where you, you're no longer balanced or have the hedge in your portfolio. Let's talk next about, we had CPI yesterday, PPI today, we've got inflation, transitory. Jim, what other, what other forces are at play? Well, I think there's a lot of forces right now in the bond market. There's at the one end, you've got the year over year base effects. So we expected that the inflation numbers were gonna jump higher because we're comparing them to April of last year when we were at the, at the height of the lockdowns and the shutdown of the economy. But on the other end, you've got the monthly data was much stronger than people thought. The <coughs> core PC, our core CPI data yesterday was up nine tenths of a percent for the month of April. The last time that number was that high was April of 82, 39 years ago. And I might add that the funds rate was 14% uh, at that point versus zero um, right now. Headline inflation was uh, up eight tenths of a percent. That was a 30 year high as well too. And then on the day we're recording, we saw big jumps in the April PPI numbers as well too. So we've seen, the base effect kick in, but we've also seen this short-term type of jump in the uh, inflation numbers. And I am, you know, one that thinks that this is going to mark a stair step higher. I've heard a lot of people say, yeah, well, it's a one-off thing. Yes, it is a one-off thing. As Ben said, airline tickets, sports tickets, men's, uh, men's casual wear, which is, you know, getting clothes, getting dress shirts, getting ready to go back to the office. They all jumped higher at a 10%-ish range for annualized range for the month of April, well, they're not going to go down 7% in May. They'll probably report zero gain in May, but you know, we, we've jumped, uh, jumped higher and we're going to stay higher with a lot of these numbers. And that's one of the reasons why I think we're going to see these numbers in inflation going to stay higher. They're not necessarily going to recede as much as everybody thinks. And that's where this gets really confusing. So the transitory forces, like you just said, with air, you know, airfares and, and used cars and and now with ca you know, casual wear, even business wear, you know, a lot of that's the reopening story. And uh, we've even recently seen evidence that uh, also consumers and workers are going to start going or are starting to go back to the office and the workplaces. So search activity having to do with everything from, you know, getting business casual wear, uh, dress shoes, getting, you know, figuring out the train station and timing again, that's, that's shooting higher, the highest it's been uh, in terms of search activity since the pandemic. On the flip side, we do see a lot of heavy interest in, um, in you know, getting doggy daycare, child care, adult care, and so on, which is signs, again, people are preparing to get back to the office. All of that is going to create this short-term, you know, kind of momentary inflation impact. The only issue is there's two big things, huge things that are the part of the sticky core CPI. And you know, a third of that is rents OER, um, which has been held down because collected rents are so low relative to you know just soaring asking rents. And the more the eviction moratorium has kept that spread wide. Once that collapses, uh, I think we'll end up seeing a nice pop in OER. A lot of our modeling using search activity again from the consumer level, how many are looking for one bedroom apartments, vacation rentals, uh, new home rentals, and so on. That is just shot up appreciably over the past two months. We have a chart here that shows that on a Z-score basis. And historically modeling that out, that, that shows that we should have about a seven, 70 to 75% probability that OER year over year will be higher a year from now. Now, I think that what's going to happen, we get these eviction moratoriums to go away. Um, some point in the middle to late summer, we're going to see the pressure on rents. And that's going to add a pretty decent amount to core CPI. I mean, it could add, hypothetically, 50 basis points to 100 basis points to the core CPI figure. And that's that's a big deal. Um, you know, that takes, as Jim was, I think, joking with me before this call, that could take us to like a three handle uh, if it really happened. And those that's a sticky development. The other thing, too, real quick is wages. McDonald's, Chipotle, even in financial services, the business we're in has seen a lot of headlines about wage increases. And that's something that's sticky, too, and will reinforce spending and also will reinforce inflation. So I think those are the more important dynamics to look at. Everything in the headlines is are these crazy numbers, um, you know, out of that airfare, uh, auto rentals and so on. That's that's added about 10 percent um, on a month over month basis annualized 
last month to inflation, while all other components at a, you know, are right around 2.2% you know, or so. So it's a big deal. Um, it's getting flashy, but there's bigger inflation dynamics to pay attention to. I, I just want to underscore a couple of things that Ben said, because uh, I agree with them. Um, OER, owner's equivalent rents, about a third of core inflation, and it's been very well depressed because of the eviction moratorium. What they wind up doing is when they ask all these uh, rental units, what are you charging? If you've got people that are not paying but can't be evicted because of the eviction moratorium, you're reporting a bunch of zeros for rent. So that's been depressing the rent numbers that we've been seeing and depressing OER. Once the eviction removal is gone and you can kick the people out that don't pay, the average rents are gonna start going back up. And as Ben pointed out with his searches, the average, the new rents, the asking prices right now are really soaring. So you could see that number go up. As I've talked about on these previous conference or press podcasts, the Fed likes to talk about, oh, I'm Charlie Evans, and I think we could go to 2.5% core inflation, and that would be okay because it average out with our two number. We're at three right now. And if OER sticks and we're like mid threes, Charlie, you said two and a half. We're at three and a half. So what are you going to do about that? You're going to just, you know, turn yourself into an even more twister pretzel at this point? Or are you going to be forced to kind of acknowledge that reality that the numbers are way above where you think? Remember, I've argued here, DGT, demographics, globalization technology, we're not doing Zimbabwe. We're not doing the late 70s or anything else along those lines. But you start seeing three handles on core inflation, four handles on headline inflation. And if the bond market has to adjust to that, that's painful for bond investors. And if it's painful for bond investors as it adjusts, stock investors are going to notice it as well too. Yeah, but I'll say really quickly to uh, sum up my thoughts is the, you know, I, I, I agree. And I think that what's going to, this could come to fruition some point in, you know, start at least in July and August. And that times really well with the Jackson Hole um, symposium and meeting. It, it, that could get interesting. You got to remember the Fed too. It's just like history. Everyone thinks things move slowly and change happens and it's this easy thing to kind of figure out, but that's not, that's not how history works. It's now, you know, wars have worked. That's and this is a bad analogy, but that's not how the Fed works either. It they'll they'll maybe kick things around, but all of a sudden, you know, when Powell's going to change his mind, he's going to change his mind. And it's going to be shocking. Um, so I, I'm I'm curious to see, and I'm with Jim that if we get some of these bigger core inflation prints and stickier stuff to stick, uh, that taper could be you know somewhere in that Jackson Hole meeting or, or shortly thereafter. So that that is going to get the mod market going. Well, thank you both for your thoughts today. Thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information or any questions, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.